Good morning. It's just scary. Try again. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Law and Entrepreneurship in Silicon Beach. We're very glad you're here. My name is Joel Fewer. I'm the Executive Director of the Lowell Milken Institute for Business Law and Policy at UCLA School of Law. And we're the sponsor of this conference. This conference was conceived and developed by my colleague, Professor James Park, who's also the faculty director of the Lowell Milken Institute. And I want to thank him and also uh, the business law faculty at UCLA School of Law, who were also helpful in developing this conference, and especially Professor Stephen Bainbridge and Professor Iman Anatawi, who will help us moderate our panels today. Our conference today focuses on fundamental legal and policy issues that entrepreneurs face. In our first panel this morning, we start at what, what, so we start at what most people see as the most important part of entrepreneurship, the exit. And in particular here, the exit in which the startup is the target of a uh, merger or an acquisition. Those transactions involve many, many difficult legal and uh, business issues, including what is the actual value of the startup and how to make the startup actually work for you once you acquire it. In the second panel, we're going to turn to issues of governance and control. And while these issues have been faced by all companies, new and old, now over the last few years, there have been a couple of companies, notably Facebook and Snap, that have used dual class stock, which has caused a lot of vigorous policy debate among academics and others. The issue about founder control permeates um, almost all the governance issues for entrepreneurs, and it goes well beyond what, whether you have more than one type of stock. So we'll be looking at that in the second uh, conference panel. In the third panel, we're going to discuss financings and relatively new modes of attracting capital investment through the Jobs Act and initial coin offerings. And although many lawyers still think of IPOs as the paradigmatic way of raising capital and accessing the capital markets, the uh, decreasing number of public companies in the country seems to suggest that that's not the future, and the future is in other modes of accessing capital. We've structured each of these panels so at the end of each panel there'll be time for you to participate and to ask questions. If you've been to our business law breakfast, you know that we enjoy having a very active audience and we hope that you will participate in the conversation today. We're excited also to feature a box lunch conversation with Brian Lee, who's a graduate of UCLA School of Law and one of the region's leading serial entrepreneurs. Law School Dean Jennifer Manukin will facilitate the conversation with Brian Lee, and we think that's going to be a very exciting and interesting conversation. Our, visit, our vision for this conference, Law and Entrepreneurship, really goes beyond today. What we see today is the first of a series of conferences and events sponsored by the Lowell Milken Institute that focuses on entrepreneurship in Southern California and beyond. As everyone in this room knows, Southern California has developed a very, very powerful and robust entrepreneurship community. And more importantly, in my mind, the factors for entre entrepreneurship are present here in Southern California. We have major research universities, including, of course, UCLA. We have industries already that thrive upon technological change. And we have an infrastructure, including knowledgeable advisors, that supports entrepreneurs. We want the Lowell Milken U Institute and UCLA School of Law to develop into a principal forum for discussions of policy, law, and economics surrounding entrepreneurship in Southern California by convening all of you, entrepreneurs, investors, lawyers, other service providers, and others who participate in the entrepreneurship community. And in addition to providing just a physical forum for people to meet, we can, of course, access scholarly perspectives and thought leaders in Southern California and throughout the country to come and be part of that conversation. Looking beyond this conference, we anticipate future conferences on such issues as regulatory issues for entrepreneurs and for regulators faced with disruptive businesses. 
the role of the state and local government in building a vibrant entrepreneurship community, including urban planning for an entre entrepreneur-based economy. New opportunities provided by crowdfunding and initial coin offerings, and medical and healthcare entrepreneurship. We, that is, the Lowell Milken Institute and UCLA, are well situated to help the Southern California community leverage the fabulous resources here at UCLA. In addition to a top tier law school, we have top of the class medical school, engineering school, business school, all kinds of experts who can join our conversation. The law school, along with the campus itself, has really jumped into entrepreneurship. In addition to teaching several courses that are designed to train the startup lawyers, we also have the Lowell Milken Institute Sandler Prize for New Entrepreneurs. This is an annual competition, and we're coming close to the end of that competition. On April 11th, we'll have our final round. We had an uh, invite out there on the desk. We hope you'll pick it up and uh, RSVP and attend the final round on April 11 when you'll see five or six absolutely fabulous UCLA teams competing for prizes worth $100,000. Finally, I invite your ideas for what we should be doing in entrepreneurship. You can reach me uh, by email at fewer, F as in Frank, E-U-E-R, at law.ucla.edu or through our website, Lowell Milken Institute. So now I'm going to turn it over to Professor Anatawi and our first conference panel. Uh, thank you, Joel, and, and welcome everybody. In addition to the factors that Joel outlined that um, make uh, Los Angeles an attractive place to found a startup, I had to take a double take the other day. I was uh, listening on the radio to someone who said that another factor making LA attractive uh, is housing prices. And um, I must have been talking relative to the Silicon Valley, of course. And um, it occurred to me that, that only in a world of unicorns could, could this be true. Um, so, uh, but we're here, this is the uh, M&A panel, and uh, we're here to talk about getting out, um, not getting in. Um, I, uh, I'm Iman Anatoly, and I teach mergers and acquisitions, transactions here. It's a simulation-based course designed to get students uh, ready for the practice uh, of law, in particular, uh, with a focus on mergers and acquisitions. Um, uh, on my far left is Brandon Corderaro. Uh, he's head of digital media at Intrepid Investment Bankers. It's a specialty investing ba investment banking firm based in Los Angeles. Um, next to him is David Hernand, a partner at Paul Hastings, who focuses on mergers and acquisitions media, uh, entertainment, and technology. Uh, he's, he's an attorney, and so is Andrew Erskine, uh, a partner at Oric. And uh, his focus uh, is in venture capital uh, and private equity. Um, so just as Joel mentioned, the format will be for me to pose questions, and um, our panel will take those initially. But please uh, keep notes, because we'll save 15 to 20 minutes for your questions at the end of the hour. Um, so uh, we talked about the decision, uh, beginning of the decision to exit. Uh, startups seem to be, uh, they seem to be able to stay private for longer um, these days and raise, uh, raise financing at increasingly high, uh, even nosebleed valuations. So I want to start with Andrew. Um, is that your impression? And really, what is the right time for a company to seek an exit, if at all? Yeah, well, it's certainly true that companies are raising money at uh, more money at higher valuations and staying private longer. And those things are all really um, correlated uh, for pretty straightforward reasons. Um, they're sort of macroeconomic conditions that have funneled um, an enormous amount of capital uh, into our economy over the last 10 years and uh, historically low interest rates and inflation rates um, leave investors seeking high rates of returns where they can get them, uh, and that's led to greater and greater funds at sort of an increasing rate going into the venture capital industry. Uh, so now you've got uh, a large amount of funding and it has to be deployed, and those investors are, are competing for the best companies. So they're more willing to give these companies more money, they're more willing to offer it at higher valuations and take lower percentages of the company in return. Um, and therefore, the companies are obviously given an opportunity to stay private longer, given that they simply have access to a significantly greater amount of capital. Um, 
So in terms of, you know, when's the right time to um, turn that spigot off and, and consider selling out? Um, I guess the cynical answer is whenever somebody's willing to give you more money than you can say no to, but I <laughs> would say that for founders who uh, by and large, uh, you know, care about the things that they're building and want to see them uh, survive long term, uh, you know, the right time is when you see an opportunity and you've made a decision that in order to get your company to continue to grow and thrive on the trajectory uh, on which you want it to, uh, that you see an opportunity to join forces with a platform that's either better capitalized or better positioned in the market that you're competing in. So, so that's interesting because, um, you know, I, I wonder, I'm going to just turn it over to Brandon, who's our, our business uh, analyst, our investment banker. I, I'm, I'm curious, um, is it even feasible for a startup to remain independent and just develop its business organically these days? You know, I, I think you've got a lot of options that hadn't been available, as Andrew said, you know, whether it's uh, different pools of capital, things SoftBank's Vision Fund, other groups that are actually, you know, putting in more and more financing at a later stage. But, you know, to, to your earlier point, as far as being able to develop independently, you know, platforms like Facebook, uh, Amazon, uh, YouTube, right, is actually giving birth to a lot of different pockets of companies that had never been able to exist and are actually, you know, able to generate revenue and finance themselves at a much earlier stage and then actually raise a round of capital uh, down the road when they have revenue growth versus kind of a, an early A or a, a, a seed funding. So, um, you know, the other side of that too is we're seeing a lot of investors really look to companies to continue to grow and do, you know, what they want to do organically, invest behind great leaders, great business plans, uh, you know, really growing, uh, whether it's a software company or a digital media. With, when you're growing, the investors are always going to be behind you and you're probably going to continue to find capital. I think it's when you start to see hiccups and pivots and kind of a flat line of growth, that's when that next pocket of capital might not be around and you, you probably need to start looking for either an exit or kind of some other uh, uh, scenario where you can find a, a strategic exit. Well, that makes sense because because investors stay, investors are ultimately once you raise your financing are going to want to see that an exit is forthcoming. So, um, did I you just, have something to I add? I just want to, to add yeah. a comment there. I think we can view that M and A activity and the and the the whole concept of companies staying private longer in a context of the innovation cycle in the economy increasing in pace over the last thirty years. And if you sort of think about the industry incumbents and how long they manage to stay incumbent, or I should say the, the time for which it takes to replace the incumbent has been speeding up. And so you, um, and at the same time, companies are getting bigger. There's greater consolidation. So these, it, it takes a lot less money to start a company these days because you, everything can be done virtually and outsourced you, when, 20 years ago, when I was working with growth companies, they were having to spend, raise a lot of money to buy servers and to buy network infrastructure. And now all of that is leased through Amazon Web Services and Google and other providers. Uh, so there's, it's much, takes much less money. You have the ability to accelerate at a much more rapid clip. Uh, companies have gotten very good at viral adoption. And so they have the ability to go from start to a pretty impressive scale in just a few years and then start attracting significant amounts of capital and there's much less interest in um, going to the IPO, go going to the public markets as a way of attracting that capital because the private markets have so much more capital in them than they had historically. So you don't have to go public to attract that 50, 100, 200, billion dollar raise, there's now a whole private market that, that's willing to do that. So I think a number of those factors contribute uh, to companies staying private longer. So once they, David, once they do decide to ex exit, um, what are the factors that uh, are typical for a company to consider? What do you counsel companies to consider in deciding whether to go public or to pursue um, a sale by an acquirer? Um, can a, can a company also have heard of dual tracks? Can a company pursue both at the same time, a public uh, exit and a, uh, a sale? The, the timing for any 
exit is critical. It's all in the timing. You also got to build a great company that someone wants, but a lot of it is, is, uh, is timing. You can build a, the most amazing company, and if by the time you get around to selling it, it's out of favor, uh, you, you will have a hard time selling it. Uh, it. It's worth noting that for many growth companies, and I would say the vast majority of growth companies, they end not in you know, an IPO or a billion dollar valuation, but they end in a safe landing uh, uh, kind of coming in with a wobbly landing and landing and uh, you know selling for where the investors make little money or maybe get their money back and no one on the management team does particularly well. That is what happens in the vast majority of cases. I realize what you read about are the successes and it's very easy to sort of get fooled into thinking that this must be really easy and that any of us can do it. Um, so a lot of it comes down to timing. So you look at a recent sale like Ring uh, for 1 .1, allegedly $1.1 uh, $1 billion. And uh, you know, credit to the team there that has been working for several years on their product. Um, they, you know, I don't want to say that they got lucky. They did a very good job and they built a very profitable business. They also happened to be doing that at a time when home automation has become a central theme and focus for Amazon, Google, Apple, and so all of a sudden you look at that company, you realize they're gonna get bought up. And in fact, I had, a, had an early discussion with the founder uh, about uh, several years ago, and he was about possibly, you know, whether they would ever sell, and he was absolutely adamant that they would only go public. He wanted to have a public company. And what happens is he built such a great company and, he, and it coincided with um, this appetite among very big players who can write very large checks uh, that they gave him an offer that he ultimately couldn't, uh, couldn't resist. So in terms of the process, um, I have seen oftentimes uh, an IPO is considered, companies do pursue a dual track process. They will decide that they want to find an exit. Sometimes that's driven by investors wanting, they've been in the company a long time and they want out. Sometimes it's driven by the founder who's, who's been killing himself or herself and his or her spouse is complaining about the fact that he or she never sees the other for uh, any ever and wants, finally wants this to come to an end. Uh, and so there could be a, a variety of factors uh, or just a sense that the timing is right. And they will uh, decide to hire a banker often and start a, a joint process of using an IPO really as another stocking horse or another potential bidder, if you will, in a sale process. More often than not, those transactions end up leading to a sale. And if you look at the uh, history of venture, it used to be that of your successful exits, you know, if you're a VC firm, of your successful exits, half would go public and half would be sold. And over the last 10 years, uh, it's been 90-10 in favor of sale, and the numbers actually may skew even more towards uh, M&A. Uh, there's relatively few IPOs in comparison to what there used to be. I'll, st I'll stop there. Okay, well, we can come back to some of these issues because they're, they're fascinating. So, um, you know, you mentioned Ring, and, and Ring was obviously positioned um, to garner uh, a, a very um, attractive valuation. So uh, I, I want to ask Brandon, um, when you work with a, a company to groom that company to um, eventually uh, put itself up for sale and take the merger and acquisition route, um, how do you as an investment banker help that company to position itself to, to maximize its value? Yeah, so, you know, I think one of the interesting things about investment bankers is actually the best outcomes are when we're introduced or we have a relationship for two or three years in advance of a sale. And that allows us time to get to know the team, really develop a relationship of trust and kind of, uh, you know, counsel uh, in a different manner than the gentleman up here. Um, but really work with them to understand where the business is. And, and what's important here is a lot of great teams and great companies are really focused on their product, the development, selling. So they're in the weeds. They don't, you know, they're not looking up. They're not thinking about selling to Amazon. They're not, you know, kind of entertaining or, or even you know, taking meetings with tons of people, they're singularly focused on their product. And a good banker can come in and really understand, distill down what they're doing well, position the highlights of the company, and I think really recommend, you know, different types of processes that 
should be able to you know garner a premium value in the market so right now we're working with a business that actually uh, hopefully will be done in a couple weeks but we've been working with them for two years and we had conversations a year and a half ago in a kind of business development effort with a select group that we know would be interested down the road but not at that time so good bankers understand the landscape understand the pockets of where you're going to fit how you're going to fit um, you know you look at ring and home automation obviously uh, JP Morgan did that deal but those guys were able to kind of usher them through and, and really talk to the groups and the buyers that uh, made the most sense and I think the other thing that bankers really do as well is you know understand the landscape of the terms to push for uh, you know how to kind of position the company's you know financials going forward you, you know early stage is less so but add backs and really non-recurring items and make sure that you're capturing all of the value that you can for these teams and really pushing on synergies and the opportunity to you know be paid for everything today that even if it you know comes in a couple years from now uh, thank can, you. can I make a comment yeah. about bankers uh, I get asked a lot by clients because the lawyers uh, oftentimes are engaged particularly if we've been company counsel we've been engaged long before we get to the point of hiring a banker we have a long-term relationship with the client and I get asked a lot whether uh, a company should hire a banker uh, in connection with the deal and uh, my answer is always yes uh, if, you, if you can find the right banker um, I, I do think it's important to have a good, trusted relationship with your banker. There's a tendency uh, among founders and sometimes among others around the table to think, you know, I'm going to have to pay the banker, you know, a point and a half or whatever fee you end up negotiating on the deal. And so I want to save the money and not do that. When you think about the, the, a deal of a whatever size, uh, particularly if it's a large size, that the amount that the banker has to move the needle in terms of value to justify his or her existence is, is tiny. When you think about the skill set of what it takes to be a successful founder, it's usually not being very experienced in M&A transactions. And you've got to have perseverance, you've got to have technology prowess, you've got to have good management skills, you've got to have creativity, be able to push through boundaries. Being a stickler for adhering to a process and selling a company is not usually the strong set of uh, strong skill set of most founders and even of a lot of board members and VCs. And it always amazes me that um, VCs who will VCs will see 95 companies for every company they invest in, or some ridiculous statistic like that, and then they will spend five to ten years with a company, and then they'll get to that value maximization point. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, you guys go sell the company. <laughs> and to me, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a crazy notion. And so having uh, someone uh, smart who has a lot of experience running that process is critical. Thank you. Um, so, so, Andrew, you work with, with a, num I mean, a wide range of companies, but um, you know, many of them are, are uh, um, early stage companies. Um, and I'm curious, there seems to be a lot of anxiety about going public these days, and companies that are public want to go private. Nordstrom's um, is, is currently in discussions to, to uh, go private. The family is making a bid. Um, uh, and uh, there are other examples. So do you, uh, when you're uh, talking to clients who are thinking about going public, is, is, um, is preparing them for going public, uh, you know, uh, is that something that, that you warn them about, about the difficulties of meeting uh, investor expectations? I mean, the preparation is obviously pretty different. I mean, in the short term, obviously, you're, you know, you're going public, you're focused on transitioning to be compliant with a series of highly complex regulatory schemes and when you're you know thinking about and preparing for selling the company you're really talking about just pure single point maximization of value so securing your assets and making sure they're latent liabilities things like that so um, they're obviously different um, I think we try not to counsel our companies to the extent of you know you do or don't want to go public. I think um, there is a pervasive you know, notion in the venture market of the difficulties of being a public company. And you obviously see it. I mean, you know, Snap's not exactly had a great first year of going public. Um, and the, um, the perception that the company's taken has been 
pretty aggressive, uh, but similar things happen with one of the most valuable companies in the world, and Facebook, in their first 12 months. I mean, it's just, it's hard sort of getting used to being a public company um, and having different sets of expectations on you. So, um, you know, we, we try and counsel companies to just basically build a vessel that is capable of having a smooth transaction in either case. Uh, so being prepared, you know, this goes back a little bit to something that Brandon was saying about, you know, you want to be having relationships with high quality service um, well before you're ever getting to one of these points um, because the whole value is that someone is seeing everything that goes right and everything that goes wrong at that endpoint and then reverse engineering all the guidance that they're giving you. So whether it's IPO or whether it's M&A, it's really just a matter of sort of seeing the risk points and making sure that they're steering away from them. So, so David, how much hand-holding do you do when a, a company's um uh, anticipating sort of the public market as uh, as a monitor uh, versus being acquired by uh, a, a friendly uh, a friendly buyer. It's a different kind of hand holding. Um, the so few companies go public these days that it doesn't it doesn't come up all that often. Companies will talk about it and want to know well what does it mean what is it like and you you sort of advise them on all the reporting they're going to have to do and all the compliance work that's going to need to be done both prior to the IPO and on a go-forward basis. Uh, so it's more just preparing them for that kind of uh, regimented reporting and compliance regime that they will have. Um, oftentimes that's enough to scare them out of uh, want, wanting to go forward with that. Uh, the system has gotten uh, so complex. Um, but uh, I, think, I think all three of us would probably acknowledge that a large part of our jobs are uh, more playing psychologist with our clients and uh, and uh, walking, uh, helping them uh, deal with these types of issues. Yeah, thank thank you. Um, so so Brandon, um, with particular, I know you're um, uh, in the in the digital media uh, space. What particular what special issues arise um, in selling a growth company, a high growth company, from a business perspective? So I'll let these guys handle all the the legal aspects, but I think. You know, one of the, the biggest things that comes up in growth companies, obviously, is, uh, as, as David was saying, you know, you've got timing. When's the right time to actually go to market? You've got a continued kind of path to either profitability, significant revenue growth. You know, are we going to be rewarded today for kind of tomorrow's revenue? You know, business issue one. Two, relating to that is, you know, a lot of time earnouts and, you know, not 100% deal will come up. I think earnouts are probably uh, the hardest thing to navigate, work through, and, and frankly, um, push for in a high growth company, right? Okay, you're, you're here today and you know you're gonna be here in two years. Well, you should have no problem agreeing to an earnout, but in deals, and, and these gentlemen can kind of talk about it as well, you know, when you're acquired by a company, for a majority they own you and, and they can do kind of as they wish with accounting, with cost, everything from there on out and supporting the business to meet those projections. Um, the other thing I think that just comes, that we see as business issues is really, you know, the, the team itself, right? The independence that these growth companies have and kind of the idea of what they wanna do and what they wanna accomplish doesn't always mesh well once it's inside of um, a large organization. I mean, I've seen it work really well and then, you know, we've also seen it, uh, acquisitions and, and frankly, great deals on paper turn into uh, a hodgepodge and a mess later on. And uh, one deal in particular, you know, was uh, the company was set to go public. You know, it was a high growth business. A uh, company acquired it. Um, everyone had kind of visions of we just got a great deal and we're going to be huge owners in a, in a pre-IPO company that, that'll be out in six months, so we're gonna get a double pop. And, you know, that was something that we advised against. And, you know, sometimes uh, founders, VCs, and other people in charge and, and kind of picking the path uh, have visions that are, are beyond um, some of the other uh, people around the table. So I'd say growth, earn out, and, and uh, you know, uh, issues like that are probably the most common for us and, and reward on the valuation. I just want to pick up on the on the earnout comment. So, so the earnout would be a mechanism by which I mean, it seems like it's especially appropriate in in a high growth company, whereby um, there might be some disagreement about the value of the company um, and its uh, its potential, its prospects. So, where, whereby the buyer would would defer some of the payment and make it um, 
uh, subject to meeting some performance metrics. Are, are you seeing more earnouts um, in uh, in deals uh, recently in, in the tech space? Is that something you see more often than outside of tech? Are you seeing more? I, th I think we're seeing. I think we're seeing less. Are you seeing more? I mean, it, it depends really on the situation. It, it's case by case. I think a lot of times that. You know, depending on the performance of the business and whether it's a strategic or another financial or a strategic that doesn't necessarily have the uh, capabilities to, um, you know, kind of absorb the full cost of that acquisition and they're willing to reward later on based on what's coming. Um, I, I would say we're seeing it less, but we see it in term sheets and indications and LOIs very, very often, right? right? And they don't necessarily win, but it's a, a big reason that you might actually take less consideration overall with no earn out rather than potentially a bigger win. Okay, so, so that's very interesting to me as, as an academic because I would expect with higher valuations and more uncertainty, we'd be seeing more so. I'd like, to, Andrew, to what do you attribute um, that there are, you're seeing fewer, is it pushback? Are the sellers just, are they uh, being able to yeah. negotiate their own terms? Yeah, well, we certainly encourage them to push back. I mean, one of the conversations we try to have is just sort of understanding the difference between funds being put in escrow and, and funds uh, being offered to you in an earn out, um, and that, you know. You may just want to take a minute to explain the, the, the earn out mechanism. Sure, sure, outside. I mean, the general concept is, you know, we're gonna pay this much for you, but if you hit these X number of metrics over this amount of time or in these um, areas, then, your, you know, your acquisition price is going to go up. We're going to uh, pay you more over those times. Um, and I mean, I, I think one of the things that I try to encourage founders to understand is that, you know, if you were well capitalized or sufficiently capitalized over that same time period, what do you think the difference in the valuation of your company would be? And do you think that's relative to what you're getting paid over this time? Um, I just, you know, and I'm sure Brandon sees this and, um, and David sees it as well, is that, you know, once you're inside that company, you don't actually necessarily have control over all the decisions that go into what you're doing to maximize the value of your company. Um, and so it can just be particularly difficult to, um, to hit those benchmarks. Uh, and then also, you know, well, I'll leave it to that. Okay, well, I'll just add that the maybe, seller's maybe, projections may be a little rosy um, maybe as just, well. Um, amplify that a bit. So the reason you have an earn out is you often have a disagreement as to valuation. And you will have a conservative buyer who maybe is a public company that has to live and die on earnings. And when they look at a company that has low earnings but high potential, they want they got to be concerned about the story they tell the street. Conversely, the startup has a usually it's a hockey stick projection and we're just at that inflection point and yeah I realize we're just trending up but man it's all blue sky from here and so the only way the parties can get comfortable is with an earnout. so for the conservative buyer they say yeah we're willing to pay you more if you can deliver the rub is you have to agree on what those milestones are so we end up having protracted negotiations over that and almost Invariably, and there have been some exceptions where it worked out well, almost invariably what happens is when big company acquires small company, big company can't resist the temptation to want to do different things than just leave the small company alone and let it operate independently, uh, and, and, and for good reasons. So when uh, Nordstrom, you know, big conservative company, uh, acquired a company called Hot Look, which was a fashion uh, online fashion business uh, here in Los Angeles in 2008. A big part of the deal was an earnout. This is all public information, um, and it you know it it was done for exactly the reason that I described, trying to bridge the gap on valuation. Uh, Nordstrom, in addition, part of the reason they were interested is they had a big brick and mortar business. They had a big online business. They also had Nordstrom Rack which is sort of a second, uh, uh, second or off price products. Uh, and they wanted to better integrate that kind of off price experience with Hotlook, which was sort of an online off price uh, model. And they wanted to get the benefit of these you know, young entrepreneurs. And so immediately they wanted to start putting these entrepreneurs into a larger role that was different than just Hotlook. And it creates conflict. So now they want to take, you know, Terry Boyle out of Hotlook and have him run Nordstrom Rack because that online integration in a world that's moving to online becomes more important, creates conflict and, and much harder to uh, to make it work. Yeah, and then Staying away from the top line entrepreneur, look at the second and third level technical people. 
people, the creative people in the small company or you have a big acquisition. They don't want anything to do with that environment. So they st start looking around for other opportunities. To, and if the market is hot, bye-bye. And then that hockey stick, because when you get some going out the door, they tell other people already inside, you know, look where I've been going or she's going or something like that. And so the environment <coughs> that was key, that's hard to define, articulate, that um, is the lifeblood of why that particular startup looked like it had a lot of potential, it just starts to dissipate. So thank you. That, that's interesting because earnouts are risky for sellers. And so when sellers have leverage and the markets change um, uh, and sellers are, uh, are um, in the driver's seat and uh, they, they, they may have more success um, just getting uh, a higher valuation now and, and uh, getting, um, getting their consideration, their, their payment now and not having to worry about trying to meet uh, those those uh, hurdles down the road under different and conditions that can't be predicted or controlled. Um, so uh, I, I, I wanted to get back though to, to selling um, a growth company from, from a legal perspective when we're dealing and, and in the Silicon Beach now we're seeing um, that we can attract the, the higher growth companies. Um, are there some special legal issues? Uh, so both uh, you know for Andrew and David that um, uh, are unique to uh, the high growth companies or the tech companies? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, there, there are key issues that you see in, in every deal um, and they get broken down. You know, you can sort of think of them in several buckets. You know, one of them is obviously economic, you know, uh, not just what you're getting paid, but the type of consideration you're getting paid and what your escrow and earn out provisions look like. Um, and then also some of the legal issues that come along with the fact that, you know, like David said, most companies aren't getting sold for trillions of dollars. Um, in these private companies, there are liquidation preferences that exist for these investors. But in order to get yourself to the point at which you can sell the company, there are also sort of fiduciary duties that these investors who are sitting on the boards have to be mindful of in terms of uh, incentivizing the management and the teams to be building these companies to the point where they can sell for reasonable valuations. Um, so you have a little bit of um, um, you know back and forth with with what your um, what your decisions to be made there are. You also have retention issues um, that typically come up. I mean, and it's it's pretty standard that. Not just, you know, you're a founder and you're going to be a new employee at Google and so they're going to give you a salary and an equity package. But in addition to that, there's this sort of reverse vesting concept that's become almost standard in, um, in both, you know, Silicon Valley and obviously the same, time of deal, same types of deals um, that are in this community as well, which is that, you know, as much as 50, maybe even 80 percent of your share of that top line um, uh, consideration in the deal is going to be held back. Um, and contingent upon you continuing to work at that company for 12 months, 18 months, two years, depending on what it is. Um, and then also from the retention perspective, something we've all been sort of touching on, which is you know, the, the level of control that you're gonna have within that company and your ability to make the decisions that you wanna make, not just in order to drive growth of what you're building, but also just have the freedom to continue to grow what you want. Um, and then there's always you know, just risk allocation issues of you know, what happens if between you know signing a deal and the regulatory review that's required to close the deal, things start going sideways. Who's paying for those things? Who's making decisions and during that time? So um, those are sort of the the bigger buckets that I think of when you see the primary legal issues that come up in these deals. Yeah, Dave, do you have anything to add? Yeah, there's a there's a handful of issues that seem to come up an awful lot in selling growth companies and. Growth companies are often not prepared for the onslaught of diligence, careful diligence that's done by very large acquirers. Uh, I was selling a, a small company uh, for small company for a few hundred million dollars and, um, many years ago, and they were being sold to eBay, and they were a little surprised that there were 50 eBay uh, employees, lawyers, finance people. Uh, that were poking around the data room, that were flying down to meetings at the company. And this is a company that had been around for a few years, and they certainly had no idea what was coming. Um, and big companies who are careful uh, and have, you know, the tax guy or maybe a whole tax department, and they are going to focus on tax issues like you have no idea. And that is their lifeblood. 
and they are going to focus on those issues and they're going to want all those issues addressed. You got the employee benefits people, you got the IP people, and uh, so all of these issues come up in the process of diligence. It's a little over it can be a little overwhelming. The issues that tend to come up are uh, issues of IP ownership. So you are a startup. Uh, you have, you know, in many cases, bootstrapped your organization. You had some great app or some great service, and you started it, and you got some consultants when money was tight to help uh, get your code written. And, or maybe you've decided to outsource a big part of your operation to some great developers that a friend hooked you up with in Ukraine. Uh, we are uh, in the era of the multinational startup, so it's very common. You've got people in, in many different jurisdictions. And uh, that ultimately becomes an issue of, well, who actually owns the IP? And did you have proper documentation assigning all the IP from these different uh, people who touched IP who are working on it around the world? Um, or uh, in, in, in uh, some cases after a deal gets announced or rumors spread, it's not uncommon for competitors uh, to lob in uh, letters and complaints that, you know, you know, actually we own their IP or we have this patent that they're infringing. Uh, Mr. Wessel was involved uh, in a case, in a deal with me many years ago that involved one of competitor lobbying in a patent uh, infringement uh, claim right in the middle of our deal negotiation that ended up um, nearly uh, derailing the deal. So um, that, that tends to come up. Another issue that's a big issue right now with growth companies is employee and independent contractor classification issues. You know, so we have uh, labor rules, particularly here in California, that uh, don't really contemplate the sort of virtual employee or shared employee construct that we, we now have sharing, don't contemplate the sharing economy where we share employees. Uh, and so we have big companies have to be very attuned to that and that is a, that seems like an issue that comes up an awful lot. Another issue that comes up are 409A issues. So issues around uh, compensation arrangements that are not properly documented, whether it's uh, equity plans where there's not really good documentation supporting the, the strike price on options that are granted uh, or, or other arrangements where there are sort of complex and long-term payouts and that becomes, that's an area of much focus particularly for the you know, pointy-headed benefits uh, lawyers sitting in-house and that's their lifeblood, uh, those become big issues. Uh, social issues, um, and Andrew alluded to this. The, it's an it's a issue in every deal, it's not limited to growth companies. What role are different executives going to play? What is their package? At what point do you negotiate their compensation package? So you're trying to sell a deal and yet the CEO won't surprise you is singularly focused on his compensation arrangement. Uh, or the board members are focused on their compensation arrangement. So all of those issues have to be managed. And then I'll, I'll mention that um, an interesting one that started to pop up in deals is the, uh, what I call the Harvey Weinstein Clause uh, that is starting to work its way into representations and warranties. That's not surprisingly, uh, buyers want to know that there have been uh, no claims and that you have no knowledge of any basis for any claims uh, that any of your officers, directors, depending, you know, argument over how low in the organization you might go, uh, but not surprising, given everything that we're hearing, that that is now showing up, uh, showing up in agreements. Well, I'm about to teach reps and warranties, so I have to ask you. So, is that a special rep um, in addition to the litigation rep? I have a couple of students here. It um, doesn't specifically reference Harvey Weinstein by name, <laughs> <laughs> but I think everyone knows what it's about, including without limitation. Okay, I'll have to get a. a, a that stuff's a, interesting too, because you know. Typically, in investor agreements that are negotiated well before acquisitions, there are limitations put upon what sort of reps and warranties the um, investors or directors are going to be expected to, to have to give in an acquisition setting. And so the expectation that they're going to give that representation starts to come in direct conflict with things that everybody's already agreed to. Uh, and it can you become, mean in an earlier stage at a term sheet? or Yeah, so often time? you have, um, you know, in typical venture deals, you have voting agreements uh, upon which there are sort of contractual expectations of what's going to happen in the event that a company is sold. Um, part of that is that if a significant number or predetermined um, group of stockholders uh, approve a transaction, that the rest of the stockholders are going to go along with that. Um, 
that approval, um, but those things are limited to certain conditions. Um, for example, you know, investors aren't going to have to give various reps and warranties about themselves. It's really about the company. But you see things like this coming up, and there's a direct tension where the acquirer doesn't really care what was previously agreed to, um, and it can it can slow down a deal while you're negotiating those things. Well, thank you. Um, so, uh, turning since we, we've uh, um, you know started to uh, discuss it, the the sale process. Um, Brandon, what should a company expect from an M and A uh, sale process? It sounds like it can be very disruptive um, and distracting to management. Um, how do how do you, as an investment banker, how do you shepherd a company through that process? So, I mean, when we work with companies, obviously we um, you know try to do everything we can to shield management from the disruption that occurs. But you know, as as the song kind of goes, there's a lot of ups and a lot of downs. Um, you know, the process can last anywhere from, depending on the type of deal or if there's someone at the table, and usually those end up going longer, even though people think it should be shorter. Uh, you know, realistically, five to even 12 months, depending upon how ready the company is. I think getting the company prepared for process, as David was saying, to expect certain things. I mean, we're at earlier stages now, we're actually doing things like uh, code reviews with Black Duck to actually have kind of IP assignment and make sure that the code that they say is theirs isn't off the shelf, open source, uh, or is it you know someone else's library that they're not paying uh, you know license fees to, you know working with companies to you know have them or their VCs actually put a Q of E together just because a lot of finance departments at growth companies or smaller venture backed businesses uh, aren't necessarily the most prepared for a process. You know, what's gap versus what's cash accounting, you know, on the software side, what's billings, bookings, recognize revenue, it, it, numbers can move a lot. So I think getting really that preparation and, you know, done at the outset is probably the key because as soon as you start the process and you make the first phone call, you want to know that everything in your pitch or your presentation, uh, SIM, offering memorandum, whatever you know you're taking to market and whatever you're trying to accomplish, is is accurate, correct, and that uh, the numbers are locked down. Because if you think your numbers are correct and kind of proceed to the uh, stage of really getting an offer, you sign that document, and all of a sudden eBay's 45 tax guys come in and say, "Hey, you know you've got an issue here. We need to renegotiate." That just puts the whole process on hold, derails it, and you've just completely lost all of the leverage that you had. Um, so from us, you know, the process, prepare, really get out to market, and, you know, be, be strict and be stringent on how you run your process. Uh, if people can't, you know, it sounds bad, but if people can't make timelines, usually they're not serious. If they are serious, a lot of times with a, uh, a good banker who knows them, a great lawyer, they know that the team is, you know, has the right group around them and is going to proceed with the process. Uh, the other thing too is, uh, I think a lot of people think that you can say, "Oh, if we don't get this, we're going to go get other bids." You've got one chance to bluff, and if you bluff, then and, and they call you on it, you've probably just also kind of uh, uh, decreased your chances of a soft or a wobbly landing to a, a, a big extent. Um, and then in the process too, I think, you know, really also having everyone and their alignment, you know, uh, to the extent possible done ahead of time, right? Whether it's the CEO, the investors, you have a distributed workforce and kind of different ownership structures set up, making sure that everyone knows kind of where they sit and how that's going to be treated in a deal. Uh, the last thing you want is kind of uh, people without the proper head screwed on straight at management meetings or in kind of situations with the buyer where the buyer says, hey, um, you know, what's going on with this guy? You know, what is his expectation? Um, you know, what is, what is he getting out of this deal? If you can't answer some of these questions that are, you know, key, we think are, uh, are very important to kind of have done. Well, I could go on, but I think it's a good time for me to turn over um, the floor to, to the audience. Um, and please feel free to ask questions either directly to an individual or we can all respond. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Can I ask a question about the, the earnouts? The, I understand the issue about the, the fight over valuation and earnouts being a solution, but it sounds to me like. Uh, could you just speak up just I a will, bit? It sounds Thank to you. me like the problem with the earnouts obviously is the control over obtaining 
uh, the milestones to get the earnouts. But from a negotiating standpoint, if the company, let's say the acquirer is offering $100 million, um, $300 million in earnings, right? So $400 million total, without the earnouts, what's the negotiation? It's it's $150 million, so it's like take 100 now on, and look at 400 globally, or take 150 with no earnouts. Because it seems to me like, in one way, if there's a fight over valuation, the earnouts are just gravy. Yes, you want to make them, but if you don't get them, would you have gotten a higher price up front, flat, without you know, any discounts? Okay, so what's an earnout worth? I don't know if that's a law question or a business question, so who wants to take it? Well, I can give you a, an uh, anecdote. Um, so I, I've sold two companies to Disney. Uh, one was a company called Club Penguin in 2007, and we sold it for $700 million. $350 million of that was an earnout. That's a pretty significant earnout as a percentage of the overall uh, deal. And um, would Disney have been willing to go more? You know, we don't know. That was a, a large part of the negotiation. And the company was on that hockey stick, was on the upward uh, trajectory on the hockey stick. Um, we, a few years later, I sold another company called Platum to Disney, and there the CEO refused to have an earnout. And um, we, you ended up with a significant valuation, but there was a, there was a heavy negotiation over that. And um, it was, but it, it, was, it was hard to figure out what they would have paid, um, but it usually is a, is a significantly less. So and then, it, and so many factors will depend on not just whether or not there's an earnout, but to what extent is the buyer willing to leave the company alone and give it the resources that it needs to continue growing in order to achieve those hurdles that drive the earnout valuation. Have you seen Apple's to like with earnout a term sheet with an earnout without an earnout? Well, I was I was going to say so. Your example, it's it, it's hard because you don't um, you know it's one a one off situation. But I think everyone up here would agree too that if you are going to get into an earnout, you know, um, for instance, you're not going <laughs> to agree to EBITDA or anything kind of below a revenue, right? So, if you are going to and the team wants to go forward with a deal that does have an earnout, making it on kind of a apples to apples, the highest level before any accounting tricks or any added costs or things could be put into there, you know, that that's how you're going to look to structure it. Um, you know, in, in your situation, right, it really depends on what the board wants to do. And as advisors, you know, we're, we have this situation a lot of times where, you know, we have five or six, you know, LOIs, final offers, and it really comes down to, you know, providing advice and counsel around if you've got a $250 million offer, you know, the ability to close, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if guys like us at this table sometimes would actually say do that over, you know, uh, you know, a hundred million and three hundred in earn out because you, as an entrepreneur and as a as an owner, you have to only count on what you're getting at close. You don't know what can happen later on, and and it also if you get to the point where you're arguing over it, it's going to be messy, and then it just becomes even more protracted. So. Uh yeah, so I just want to say I'm a professor, so I feel totally comfortable cold calling on you if you don't have questions. So <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> This is actually a sort of a, a, a continuation of the or not, but a little fast opening up to issues with companies after they've taken, let's say if you've taken an not. how often, what is the percentage of companies that actually hit whatever one, two, or three targets they may have? I'm assuming the earnouts aren't just one bulk sum, but probably over time, there's some time constraints. So what if they don't hit the time constraint in the first year, but they managed to hit the first time constraint in the second year, do they lose it? And how often are companies basically getting involved in causing issues with these earnouts? In other words, if 90% of companies aren't getting earnouts because of various reasons, then it's probably not a great negotiation tactic. So I want to kind of get an idea of your experiences on the problems with these. Yeah, I mean, I, I can tell you that more often than not, founders who have earnouts in their deals 
end up calling me during that earnout period asking if we're still allowed to talk with them about issues with the deal. In other words, it's pretty common that you're getting into conflict unless you're just killing it, right? Unless you're Instagram. I'm not saying they didn't have an earnout, but if they had, right? So that wouldn't have been a problem. But if you're not, there's going to be an inevitable amount of dispute. And it goes back to just what you were saying, right? So let's say you've got three time and milestone based metrics and you miss the first one, but it's clear that you're going to hit the second one or you do hit the second one. And in doing so, you hit the first one as well. Well, if you haven't negotiated that from the get go, um, then you're sort of at the mercy of this large entity, larger entity, into whether or not they're going to give you um, the benefit of that doubt. And particularly when you've got a public company that's driven by earnings, I mean, what's their incentive to do that? Um, it's, it's, it's messy. In my experience, about half end up in renegotiations. One way or the other, the buyer just decides this is unworkable. We want to do certain things with the company. We want to move people around, and the earnout is interfering with our ability to do that. Um, or they're 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 so far off the earnout targets that they're going to lose the team. So they realize that they got to figure out another way to make this work. And so this is post closing after post -closing. the deal closes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A question. Yeah. You mentioned briefly the uh, global extent of entrepreneurship these days. And I wonder if you could share just briefly what your advice, typical advice, would be to U.S. investors investing in foreign companies. Uh, in particular, for example, I had my experience last year in Canada trying to exit. It was double the legal expense and an extra six months of a judicial fairness proceeding. So I wonder if you have any sort of overall advice that you give people. I, I, I tell them to get local counsel. <laughs> I really don't have any advice when it comes to <laughs> investing in non-U.S. Uh, companies. But I know it happens a lot. Uh, so you other, other questions? Uh, I have a question about reps and warranties insurance. Uh, actually, it's twofold. First, what do you see as the main value add between reps and warranties and just tail insurance? And second, where do you predict Tail insurance in general? I'm just saying reps and warranties because it, yeah. it seems like I mean tail insurance can cover a lot of the things. So what's the main value out of having a reps and warranties um, insurance policy if you already have tail insurance in place? It's probably worth distinguishing between. Yeah, David, could you say a few words about uh, di distinguishing between tail, well, at least what I think you're referring to with tail insurance? So tail insurance often is you're, you're buying a company. And they have existing policies in place. <clears throat> it might be uh, DNO insurance, and it might be other uh, commercial insurance or other types of insurance. And the buyer might insist uh, that is uh, part of the deal uh, that there will be, and sometimes the sellers will insist that there'll be continuation policies or tail policies that last for five, seven years uh, put in place, and that will cover pre-closing conduct. So, so for, in the best example is. If there's a lawsuit post deal relating to uh, implicating the board for a breach of fiduciary duty, uh, whether it's that deal or some other action that related to pre-closing, a seller and the board of the seller entity wants to know that they're going to be protected and there's going to be insurance and they're not going to be, you know, at the mercy of whatever the buyer's insurance is or the buyer's decisions post closing. So they want to have a tail policy. Rep and warranty insurance is a pretty innovative product that came into the scene in the last 10 years. And that is, instead of having uh, the seller uh, provide, the seller still provides the reps and warranties, but the buyer will then get a policy and look to a third party, the insurance company, for coverage, either partial or full coverage, for breaches of, for post-closing indemnity claims relating to breaches of representations and warranties. And it is, it is now used probably in about half of all deals uh, particularly with private equity players, uh, because it becomes, a, if you're a private equity seller and you want to sell off one of your portfolio companies, you want to distribute out all the cash to your limited partners, and you don't want to have anybody coming back two years later or five years later with a claim. If you can have a third party come in and do their diligence and write an insurance policy, the buyer then looks to that third party to satisfy any claims, and it's very clean for the seller. 
So we are seeing that happen uh, quite a bit. Thank you. I'm going to conclude now, but our panelists, I think, are going to be here. Are you staying throughout the, the morning um, and available informally to answer any more questions? Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.